let's stop trying to be the smartest people in the room. Let's talk about how do we really learn what the customer needs and what's going to drive their behavior. Welcome to Structural Shifts by Aperture, a bi-weekly show that radically reimagines the future of work, society, and business. We take a devil's advocate approach to exploring the massive shifts transforming our economies and our world, and our guests are not afraid to challenge the status quo. To learn more about Aperture, visit aperturehub.co. In the bestseller, The End of Competitive Advantage, Rita Gunther McGrath explains how the world is moving from a world dominated by organizational systems and hierarchies to one of individual superstars where a stable career means a series of gigs. So how do we prepare for this shift? In this episode, your Structural Shifts host, Ben Robinson, sits down with Rita to work through that question and others, including, are we inevitably moving to a situation where firms become ecosystems? What is the new barrier to entry in the digital age? What are the benefits and limitations of the network effect? When we talk about strategy today, what exactly are we talking about? In addition to being a best-selling author, Rita is a professor at Columbia Business School. She is one of the world's top experts in innovation and growth, and she is a regular contributor to the Harvard Business Review, the Wall Street Journal, and other premier business publications. This is a really great episode. Enjoy the show. I wanted to start, Rita, um, talking about your book called Seeing Around Corners. And um, probably the key concept in the book is this idea of an inflection point. And I wanted to start by asking you, what is an inflection point? So an inflection point is some uh, change, uh, typically in the external environment, that creates what Andy Grove used to call a 10x shift in the circumstances under which your business operates. And what that does is it has the effect of changing the assumptions that you've been making about your business. So, of course, today we're living in the mother of all inflection points and everybody's assumptions have really changed. I mean, you know, the idea that we would be comfortable in the company of strangers has been with humanity forever. And now that's been upended. And in, in the book, you say that inflection points tend to materialize gradually, then suddenly. H- how does a leadership team stop itself from being taken by surprise by an inflection point? Well, it's really hard. Uh, and you do need to devote some time to thinking about the possible future states that your business could be in. And, you know, that that's not always easy because, you know, you're understandably busy keeping the wheels turning and, you know, making sure that the the day-to-day operations go. So what I run through in the book is a process which I call looking for early warnings, where what you're doing is establishing what I call a time zero event, which is something in the future that could have a big effect on your business, and then work backward. And so as you're working backward, uh, you'll think about what has to be true before that time zero event could happen. And I think that's a really, really useful discipline for uh, entities to follow. And as an example, um, you know, General Electric just very famously made a huge bet in 2015, 2016 on the dominance of fossil fuel as the primary source of energy. And what was interesting to me was even then, you know, you had the Paris Climate Accord being discussed. You had already an accelerating and dropping price of renewable energy uh, as as a a source of of energy. Um, And yet they made a big bet on fossil fuels. And as we know now, that was that proved to be not not the most uh, prescient of moves. And it, that's actually, I'm pleased you talked about time zero events. So that's actually one of the sections I most liked, right? Because you have this, there's this great diagram, right? Where you show there's a sort of inverse relationship between signal strength and the degree of freedom to act, i.e., you know, the, the, the earlier you spot the signal, the more time you have to, to react. But, com- but I suppose conversely, the higher the risk that, that, those efforts might actually be wasted versus, you know, when the, when the change is upon you, you've got no time to act and it's a time zero. So in the, in the book, you have a whole bunch of recommendations around scenario planning and, and how to sort of spot or put in place the metrics that will help you spot these, these signals and signal strength early. Do you, would you, would you be able to talk us a bit through that approach? Yeah. So the, what I recommend is um, take two uncertainties and these could be 
anything that you think is really uh, critical. So I'll take two that I'm using with respect to the current COVID crisis. So the first one is the nature of our social compact. And are we going to continue to have an environment which is being driven by the typically short-term um, interests of shareholders, or are we going to have an environment which really presses for more shared prosperity? And the other uncertainty, of course, which all of us are wrestling with, is uh, is the economy going to go into a long slump, or are we going to potentially have more of a, a rebound? So if you take, um, you take th- those two uncertainties, what they'll give you is for future states. Um, so the state where we continue to sort of reward shareholders above everybody else in the economy remains in a slump. I, I kind of call that, you know, les miserables. I mean, yeah. you know, the vast majority of people are going to be really unhappy and it's, it's going to be very unstable. You know, it's very, that's a very politically unstable future. And I'm, I, I'm hoping we don't end up there. If you take a case where we continue to have shareholder value dominate, but the economy kind of comes back, then we kind of have rinse and repeat of what we've been living with for the last 20, 30 years. Uh, in the case where we have a really renegotiated shareholder compact and the economy remains grim, what I think we'll have there is something like the world that FDR talked about when he talked about, uh, sorry, that was Franklin Delano Roosevelt talked about when he talked about a rendezvous with destiny. And even though he came from the privileged classes, he was very fond about saying, you know, the means of production should not be owned uh, by private hands, that they should be more broadly shared because it was tyranny otherwise. Uh, So he came out very bluntly about that. And uh, that's the case where, you know, we have more of a new social compact and the economy remains in a slump. And as it was in in Roosevelt's time, there was nothing you could do but experiment. (laughs) Nobody knew what the answers were. So there was a lot of social experimentation that took place. And then in the case where, you know, we have a new social contract and the economy bounces back, that's where I think we have the opportunity to create a really different kind of, um, call it the new, the Great Society 2.0 would be what I'd think of. So anyway, you got your four scenarios now. And then what you can do is test your um, strategy uh, against those four and say, well, how ro- how robust is it? Um, you know, do I have a strategy that only works in one of those scenarios or do I have a strategy that's robust across all of them? And you also talk about like the, I think it's the six month, the 12 month and the 18 month I don't know if you call them triggers, right? But but metrics that would indicate wh- which of these, you know, these boxes, these quadrants we're moving into. So, for example, you know, if we were going to get to this sort of new, what did you call it, the new social pack 2.0, the new social, um, you know, what what might be the sort of metrics that would indicate that? Like, it, I suppose, um, you know, Joe Biden being nominated president might be one. Um, yeah, well, you'd look at things like um, you're already seeing uh, movements for labor. Uh, you know, Amazon's experiencing worker strikes. You're already seeing workers at places like Instacart uh, exerting their power. You're seeing other politicians calling for a Green New Deal. You're seeing, you know, I mean, just I think at a public level, people are aware of just how frayed our social safety net is. And when you think about a public health crisis such as this pandemic, the fact that you've got markets dictating who gets health care, you know, I think people are starting to see the um, the disadvantages of that. Do you think the pandemic has brought forward then some uh, s- some time zero moments for for you know for various industries, healthcare being one? Oh, absolutely. Well, you know, we've been in this now long enough to have developed new habits. Um, I think it was Charles Duhigg, who's a reporter with the New York Times, who talks about uh, the power of habit, and he said it takes between thirty and sixty days to form a new habit, and we've passed that point already, right? So, yep. you know, we're now we're now learning to navigate from home. We've now made the investment. I mean, if you'd asked any of us six months ago, do you want to put all this investment in things like your new microphone or my headphones or whatever? <laughs> we would have said, yeah, yeah, we'll get to that when it, when it becomes necessary. And now all of us have been pushed into a situation where we, we have to make those investments. Well, having made those investments, do you think we're all just going to turn our backs on them when things go When things get into a more predictable place, my guess is a lot of us are going to find that we kind of like how things are. Um, And, you know, there are going to be things we don't like about it, but there are going to be things that we do. And so there will be some behaviors that will be permanently changed. If you were to, you know, to bet which industries will be most affected, I guess healthcare is one. What what about education, you know, the industry in which you work? I think it's going to be huge. 
but but more concretely, what how do you think it will change? Is it do you think it would just be obviously more remote courses, but do you think we'll also have more of a push towards, you know, skill acquisition versus general learning? Well, I've said for some time that I think the big trend for education, and I don't know that I think the pandemic may have sped this up, but I don't think it, it's independent of the pandemic. Um, we've gone way too far on assigning credentials at the level of the degree. So one of the consequences of this has been just rampant degree inflation. And there's been a fair amount of research on this, which is that jobs that technically don't actually require a four-year bachelor's degree are now posted requiring a four-year bachelor's degree. And I think the reason for that is it just makes life easier for the, the, the you know, the job. It's like a shortcut, right? Yeah, for the, for the recruiter. Well, it is, yeah, because yeah. it, you know, it's come. It's a signal, and it's not really a, a. It's not really a credential that means anything. It means you, you know, you showed up for four years, you paid your bills, you you know, handed in your homework, but it doesn't really have any meaning in terms of what you can actually do as a person. So I've said for a long time now that once you have credentialing on the basis of a skill rather than a degree. The whole edifice of higher education collapses. It'll be. It's a bit like when the music industry started to be able to sell songs by the song rather than the album. Well, yeah. you know, why would you pay for 18 songs you don't really care about when you want the one that you want, right? So if you had a credential you could get without paying for the whole stack of um, courses, wh why would you do that? And I think, um, you know, what a lot of people don't understand is is the inside higher ed, and I'll just stick to higher ed for a minute because I think at lower levels, it's, it's different than this, but inside higher education, you know, the faculty all jockey to have their courses included as part of the required courses. Well, why do you do that? Is it because, oh, the student must have this to have a well-rounded day, blah, 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 that's the bladder, that's the cover. But the real story is if you have required courses you have to deliver, that means you have to hire faculty to teach those courses. And that means you get more faculty allocation than you would if you didn't have a required course. So a lot of the structure of what we're teaching is like, you know, it's designed for the faculty. It's designed for the for the benefit of the institution, not for the benefit of the students. And so to me, that's very vulnerable, right? You, you know, you, if you're ultimately doing something that's in your own interest and not in the interests of your customers, then um, I think, you know, I think that puts you in a vulnerable place. Once we can have credentialing by the skill, once we can have credentials at a level lower than the degree, the whole kind of edifice of higher education really um is challenged. So that's an old challenge. That's been around for a while. Now, the newer challenge is, of course, what happens if, if students can't comfortably convene on campuses come the autumn. You know, we saw what happened with the spring semester. Students were sent home. If you can't be on campus in the fall, I mean, there's no way parents and students are going into massive debt, you know, for an online experience. <laughs> that's not going to work. Yeah. If it is a time zero event, that would seem to suggest that many of the incumbent institutions don't really have time to react. Is that is that fair to say? I think they're scrambling. You know, it's, it's. I mean, the, the institutions that to me are most at risk are, you know, the small liberal arts schools whose yep. premise has been, oh, we're going to give you this incredible personal development for your experience. Well, if I can't be there, I, that's not what I'm getting. So on higher education, the other thing that I think we don't take into account enough is for a lot, again, of those mid-tier smaller schools, how much of their enrollment is international students. And there are entire campuses right now that basically live on the Chinese market. And those students aren't going to be coming. It's too difficult. And how easy is it for, you, for, for institutions you know, uh, to, to change their cost base? Oh, it's very hard. Yeah. It's very hard. Well, you know, let's just start with the faculty. I mean, you know, you've got a group of tenured faculty. So by definition, that means you can't flex. Um, you can flex a bit on the adjuncts. Um, you can flex a bit on the admin staff. But, you know, it's a very asset intensive business in that you've got physical plant. So, you know, to move that around for most of the established institutions is very hard. So, so I wanted to change gears slightly now. I wanted to um, talk a bit about your previous book, The End of Competitive Advantage, because one of, the, one of the things that you take aim at in this book is some of the traditional strategic frameworks, which basically assume that firms can mobilize resources that they, can, they either control or they can acquire in pursuit of sustainable competitive advantage in their industry. And so there are a lot of, you know, there are a lot of issues with that with that statement and that, you know, those, the parameters that are assumed in those frameworks. And so I wanted to maybe just address these one by one. So the, the first thing I want to ask you is, you, you suggest that the plane of competition has moved from industries to arenas. 
Can you explain what you mean by that, please? Sure. Well, um, people have forgotten that industries are something we make up. You know, human beings make make those up. I mean, God does not come down and say, thou shalt be a steel industry. <laughs> you know, um, And I think a lot of that way of thinking came from literally industrial economics. So it was yep. economics based around the premise of an industry. And the premise of an industry says it's a set of competitors who exist. It's a set of market interactions that exist. It's a set of competitive, you know, repertoires that exist. So it's all about what I would call the fairly mature stage of, of competition, where people, you know, people know who the competitors are, they know what the interchange is, they know what the products are, they know what the value is. So it completely ignores cases where none of that's true, you know, so a brand new industry, for instance. Um, so that's the first problem. The second problem is that as industry boundaries blur, the most important competition you face may have nothing to do with others in your industry. It may be somebody from outside your industry coming in and taking some portion of what you used to get paid for or what you used to sell and using it for themselves. So uh, I think the whole notion that we compete in an industry is a bit narrow. And what we've seen over the last, certainly over the last 10, 15 years is industries competing with industries. What industry is uh, Facebook? <laughs> you know, is it a media company? Is it a publisher? Is it well, what is it? And yet, it's soaking up uh, much of the advertising revenue that provided the oxygen for many news businesses and entertainment businesses and so forth. So, in defining yourself very narrowly as an industry player, I think can create blind spots. The uh, example you use in in in, uh, in the book sitting around corners is is the fast fashion industry, right? Which do you mind just explaining how that's an, an arena, not an industry? Sure. So if you think about um, a concept that Clayton Christensen very famously popularized, which is the job to be done, he says, don't think about buying products and services. Think about them as hire. Think about yourself as hiring them to get jobs done in your life. So if you think about teenagers, just as an example, and you think about, well, what job is it that clothing does for teenagers? Well, you know, of course, the, the obvious, it keeps them warm and so forth. But, you know, for teenagers, especially clothing, it, it communicates who you are. It communicates what tribe you're part of. It communicates what tribe you're not part of. I mean, there's a lot of kind of communication that happens with clothing. And beginning in about 2003, 2004, we started to have uh, the first cell phones that had cameras on them. And if you think about teenagers, cameras, cell phones, and clothing, well, what are teenagers doing with their cameras? They're sending pictures of each other right, to, to uh, one another. So it's a very communicative kind of experience. Well, you're sending a picture and you're in you know, a blue outfit. Okay. And then you send a picture three days later and you're in the same blue outfit. And then you're at a party and you're in the same blue outfit. And I mean, how lame is that, right? So what you want is you want clothing that exists long enough for the perfect selfie. And then you want it to kind of self-destruct like one of those Mission Impossible tapes. A writer about this topic called it fashion bulimia. She says, you know, what we do is we buy all this clothing, we wear it a few times, and then we send it off to the landfill, which I thought was very interesting. But the reality of it is, and it's an ecological disaster. I mean, it's really very problematic in a lot of ways. But the companies that got on top of this have done very well. So I'm thinking of H&M and Zara and, and companies like that. And the companies that insisted on the old model. Now, I remember the old model was four seasons. And you did your designs four times a year. You sent them off to Asia. The clothing got manufactured. It got put in truck, you know, shipping containers. It came back and so forth and so forth. Well, you know, you sold the, at high prices at the beginning of the season and then you discounted what was left over. Well, who wants that, right? So the companies that have really been successful are the ones that have very, very rapid, very advanced supply chains. And I think that's that's been a very interesting example. Now, we may be at the onset of an inflection point in the other direction, you know, yeah, where yeah. people are sort of saying, fast fashion is ecologically d disastrous and we don't want that. And so now it'll be a point of pride to be in the same blue outfit every time you get a picture taken of yourself. So I don't know. I don't know where that's all going to end up. Yet also, I guess that agility and supply chains might be harder to achieve post-pandemic. Well, we've had we've had a lot of revelations about how brittle our supply chains really are and, and not enough investment in resilience. That's true. The, the second reason why some of those... Um, those strategic frameworks are, are, are flawed. I think is you know you've touched on it by talking about Zara, right? Which is they assume that the, that a company can only mobilize the, the assets that it has under its control. But if you think about somebody like Zara, actually they're they're coordinating a much bigger e ecosystem of of suppliers. And so 
I suppose the question is, are, are we inevitably moving to a situation where firms become ecosystems? And is that, you know, is that something that wasn't built into those previous models? Oh, I think that's absolutely true. Um, so there's a couple of trends there that are fairly significant. The first is that as you start to be able to transact more readily in a digital context. So prices are known, r- reputation is you know inferred digitally, transaction costs have gone way down. Um, you start to see market-based transactions where you used to have only firm-based transactions. So to be theoretical for a minute, um, there's an old theory saying, when do you need a market and when, can, when do you need a firm? And you need a firm when uh, price is unclear, uh, the risk of opportunism is substantial. Uh, the value being exchanged is not clear, and, and so forth. But if those things are straightforward, you know, bond pricing, right? You can do things in a market. And so, what we're seeing with the advent of the digital economy is more and more transactions can be conducted in markets than require a firm. So, I think that's a one big new thing. Um, The second thing is now we have many more assets that are available on markets. So you can get access to talent on an as-needed basis. You can get access to space on an as-needed basis. Um, And certainly, you know, companies like Uber would be illustrative of this. Now, I don't don't think it's without problems because a lot of those transactions have been mispriced. um, And I can talk about that later. But the, the ability to contract for things that you used to have to actually purchase, I think, is new. The, the other thing I want to ask you is about the nature of strategy itself, right? Which is, you know, very much the point you're making in, in, in the end of comp- competitive advantage, which is in an era of transient competitive advantage, strategy becomes sort of more aligned with innovation. I.e. it's less about sort of, you know, making really well judged large decisions based on historical information and much more about freeing the, up the organization to move faster, to engage in much more experimentation. So do, is that, do you think that's a, f- a fair, sort of, you know, interpretation of, of your message, which is this really strategy innovation sort of become much, much closer together? Well, I think what you see is when events move more quickly. So if you think about the typical picture of a sustainable competitive advantage, it's an advantage that goes on for a really long period. And if you have competitive advantages that last for shorter periods of time, that means you need innovation on an ongoing basis. So if you take the sustainable competitive advantage world, you needed an innovation with once every five years, right? And then the rest yeah. of it was all about execution. When you have shorter lived competitive advantages, you really need, a, you know, you need innovation um, that ha- that's more continuous because you need to be re- continually replacing your competitive advantages as the old ones expire. How does a large organization move from a situation where it's making these, you know, periodic large bets to a situation where it's continuously making much smaller bets and and experimenting much faster? Well, it comes down to how you manage your portfolio of investments. And so uh, up until very recently, I was talking about, you know, you had the core and that was sort of predictable and stable. And then you had the near field, which is sort of the next generation core. And then you had your investments in options, which are small investments you make today that buy you the right, but not the obligation to make a more substantial investment in the future. And what's happened now with the COVID situation is everybody's core business has now been shoved into this high uncertainty space. So one of the things I think that's going to be very interesting for a whole generation of leaders is we're all going to have to learn what that's like. And, you know, it is entirely possible to be in a fairly senior position in a large organization and never have had to deal with innovation. It's entirely reasonable. What everybody's going to learn now is that that's no longer the case, that everybody's going to have to see about filling out their managerial toolkit with some of the techniques that we've used in innovation for decades. One of the things I find quite positive when I, when I read um, your books and your articles is that it would be easy to say that some of these sort of industrial age giants are toast, right? Because, you know, they're so not set up for a world of constant experimentation. But actually, you take a sort of much more nuanced viewpoint, right? And, and, and instead you say that actually these guys have a lot of inv- advantages that they can carry into the digital world and they can mm-hmm. use to sort of compete very effectively against some of their digitally native competitors. What, what, do you th- what do you think some of these advantages are? And can you also give us some examples of, you know, f- of big companies, you know, big sort of industrial age companies that have made a successful transition into digital age business models? 
We've been seduced into looking at all these digital native firms as like, ooh, you know, Dollar Shave Club and Met and Casper and all those. And what we forget is a lot of those digital, born digital companies. I mean, yes, they're brilliant and I'm not taking anything away from them. But two things that I think are worth remembering is they're very, very easy to set up. And so take Casper just as an example. Um, so these were the original mattress in a box people. And I think they were probably the leaders in that for a while. But today, as Casper's desperately trying to go public and the headwinds are really against it, you have literally 173 mattress in a box companies. <laughs> so yeah. the thing is, they're very easy to start, but they're also really hard to defend. So, you know, the, 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 ease with which you can get into a digital business, I think, actually demonstrates the strength of one of the traditional concepts in strategy, which is you need to have entry barriers. And if you don't have entry yeah. barriers and you demonstrate something works, you're going to have everybody piling on top of you. So I think that's the first thing. Secondly, for established organizations, they have a lot of advantages, right? They've got, typically they've got cash flow, they've got loyal customers, they've got brand, they've got um, a lot of things that the new companies have to build. So they've got a lot of inherent advantages. Now, they've got disadvantages too. They have legacy, they have old systems, blah, blah, blah. So a company that I talk about in End of Advantage that I thought really was remarkable was Fuji, nearly identical to Kodak in its yeah. commitment to film. And yet Fuji was able to really pivot towards using their capabilities at imagery uh, and imaging into many, many different fields. So they got into medicine, they got into um, tele, you know, telehealth, they got into different kinds of power supplies. I mean, really, really interesting redeployment of their capabilities. Whereas Kodak kind of said, you know, we live and die by film and could not get out of their own way. That's an example of two very similar companies who responded very differently to the uh, shifts. In your most recent article for the Harvard Business Review, you talk about discovery-driven digital transformation, which, you know, I, th I, I thought that was brilliant, that article. And, and, but, I, but the reason I liked it was, you know, not only does it sort of practically show a large organization how it can move away from you know, making big bets to making more incremental bets, and also how to sort of step by step build its innovation proficiency, but it also address something which which we come across every day in the work that we do, which is the body corporate has an immune system, and the immune system tends to sort of you know to beat off many um, innovations or many new ideas. But what you suggest in in that article is that because these ideas start small and they gradually sort of get traction, they sort of, you know, if you like, come, come a bit under the radar. And then by the time they've got, you know, they're on the, the radar of the body corporate, they've got sufficient traction to sort of overcome the immune system. But is that, does that really happen in practice? Or do you think that these, these, these um, endeavors are, are considered almost too small to matter a lot of the time? Well, a lot of it depends on your leadership. You know, yeah. um, I think, the, the the mantra I would use would be, you know, start small, but have a compelling vision. Um, and in the article, you know, we use the example of Klockner, the German metals distribution business. And their CEO basically looked at his whole value chain and said, you know, my God, there's Facebook, there's Google, there's Amazon, there's all these trading platforms. If we don't do something about getting digital, we're going to be toast because somebody is going to figure it out, even if it isn't us. But I thought it was very interesting the way that they started. So one of the things that they began with was very simply um, digitizing their ordering system. So the first sort of instruction uh, to these two guys, he set up in Berlin in the middle of the tech center in Germany. Uh, the first thing he instructed them to do was he said, well, look, think of something, anything that's digital that makes us easier to do business with as a company. And one of the first things they tackled was getting rid of the fax in order system. So instead of sending a fax, a customer could place an order digitally. Now, wh why I think that's so interesting is it was much user friendlier on the part of the customer. But when that digital request hit the com company, there was no change required. You just responded to the digital request the same way you would have responded to a faxed request. So the thing I think is interesting is you digitized something without perturbing the incumbent organization at the time, right? Yeah, yeah. And then once you got that going, then you say, well, wouldn't it be easier if we're sending digital orders? Wouldn't it be easier if we digitized, you know, the inventory? And that way, the incoming order would know what you know what it was looking for. 
without a person having to go and look it up. And so, okay, yeah, that makes sense. So the thing I think is, you, know, you talk about antibodies. If he'd gone in there guns blazing and said, we're going to take this whole thing and, you know, digitize it all, um, you would have come smack into the antibodies and, you know, and things would have gotten screwed up. I mean, things always get screwed up in a digital implementation. And then it would have been, you know, see, it doesn't work. I told you it wouldn't work, blah, blah, blah. The orders are all messed up. The inventory is all wrong. Instead, what they did was they took it piece by piece. And they said, let's, let's, you know, let's fix the fax problem. And then once we got the fax problem fixed, let's fix the inventory naming problem. And then once we've got that fixed, let's maybe make an online store where we take out the need of a person to go pick this inventory. A customer can just pick it themselves. But I think it's that sort of step by step solving of consecutive problems rather than announcing you're going to turn the whole organization inside out. I think that's really where it makes a difference. But in that example, um, the Clocker example, did, did the CEO have a grand vision, even though he mm-hmm. achieved it through these very small steps? He did. Yes, I think he did. I think he did. Mm-hmm. Which was, you know, if, we're, if we don't do Amazon for ourselves, somebody else is going to do it. Now, he wasn't exactly clear in the beginning what that exactly looked like, but, but he felt directionally that that was absolutely where they needed to go. I suppose that's the one constant, isn't it, with, with strategy, which is you still, you know, almost even more, you've got to set a clear direction of where the organization is, is headed, even though you can be less sort of, you know, you can be less um, precise about exactly how you're going to get there. The sort mm-hmm. of, you know, the North Star becomes even more important from a, from a, mm-hmm. you know, from a, from a strategy point of view. Yeah. I mean, I think the more confused things are, the more you need strategy, right? Uh, because it orients you, it, it gets everybody, gives them the potential to be aligned around a common um, future. Um, it, it pulls you into the future. I just wanted to uh, revisit something you said about Casper and a lot of these, sort of, you know, D to C entrants, which is, you know, they, they, you know, they're easy to start or cheap to start up, and therefore they're, you know, they're difficult to defend. What is the new barrier to entry in the digital age? Is it is it network effects or is it just you know constant innovation? Well, network effects is a big one, and just so your listeners understand what we mean by that, so network effects refer to the fact that the value of a product in or a service increases with the number of other people using that product or service. And so this is not very well understood, I think, in many cases. So you know, imagine you're the only person on a dating site. I mean, you know, unless you're a complete <laughs> narcissist, I mean, that's not going to be very, very valuable. Um, so the value of the dating site goes up as as additional members um, join. But people forget that that network effects sometimes reach a limit. So I'll take Uber as an example. So Uber benefits from network effects to the effect to the extent that you have more drivers. That means you have more availability. That makes you more attractive to riders, right? But that only takes you to a certain point. So the fact that I have 24 hours seven totally available drivers in New York City doesn't help me much if I'm in, you know, Munich. So there's a, there's a sort of a localization of network effect, which which you draw in there. The second thing to worry about with network effects is they can increase, but they can also uh, fall away. So yeah. a network can peel away, even as even as um, you know it, it, it holds users in. And I think Facebook is a super interesting example of that. So what you've seen up until the recent pandemic is for younger people, they've been leaving the core Facebook product in droves. Now they've been going to Instagram and, and other uh, networks to do their exchanging, or I guess TikTok's the latest one. Um, but you know you've got a diminished network effect almost there. Um, so I think that's the first thing. Uh, you ask what what is a source of sustainable competitive advantage? Certainly, network effects are a big new one. I actually think you know people and capabilities have come back on the radar. And the reason I think that's kind of interesting is if you think about the relationship between employees and employers, you know, back in the day, the gray flannel suit days, the unspoken negotiation was you gave me stability, job stability and security, and I gave you loyalty. But what that meant was that you had people who were prepared to invest literally decades in your organization. So they got to know its idiosyncrasies. They knew what it could do. They knew what it didn't do. And because they were lifetime employees, they were very committed. You know, what we've got now is what many people have called the tour of duty economy. And so 
you've almost got people who are sort of migrants from company to company to company, which I don't think there's anything wrong with. But if you think about what's going to build something that can't be traded on a market, which is essentially what you're looking for if you're looking for an entry barrier, um, and you've got these people who are essentially free market operators, it doesn't give you any advantage that lasts, or you're going to have to pay a lot to keep them, kind of like professional sports stars, right? You know, while you've got them, it can give you an advantage, but they're they're always open to the next bidder when their contracts come up. What about those companies, you know, I guess Amazon would be an excellent example, that are able to continue to innovate? So notwithstanding the fact they're very large, they're still able to, to, to continue to deliver, you know, innovation after innovation. Is, is, is that a source of competitive advantage? It can be. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's a way of being in the world that uh, is uh, very, very hard to, for others to copy. Um, you know, a great example that isn't a tech company would be, well, they are a tech company, I suppose, but um, something like Corning. Every company is a tech company now, right? Yeah, right, these <laughs> days. Uh, but a company like Corning, where their professed strategy is we need to be 10 years ahead of our customers in terms of advanced materials. You know, their core offering is really about being innovative in the products and services they sell. Let's talk a bit about human adaptation then to, to, to this to this new world of, you know, of transient competitive advantage. Maybe, maybe let's start with individuals themselves, because as you just said, you know, we're moving to this world of sort of tour of duties, and there's this great table. I absolutely love it. There's table 7.1 in your book, The End of Competitive Advantage. And it just, I just love it because it's so succinct in explaining how the world's changing, right? So you're sort of, you say, you, you know, we're moving from a world where you, which was dominated by organizational systems to one of individual skills, a stable career path through a series of gigs, uh, hierarchies and teams to individual superstars and so on. In this world where, you know, where we are switching jobs more often and where, you know, I suppose the responsibility for career management falls to us as individuals and where these, I suppose, the return on investment of the skills we have is higher. How how should we, you know, prepare ourselves for this shift, and how do we stay ahead of that of this shift? Well, I think you've continually got to be thinking about learning. Um, you know, one of the things I do at Columbia Business School is I, I direct a number of our executive education programs, and they're very much about you know your business education doesn't stop at the age of twenty eight. Yeah. So even if you have an advanced degree, even if you have a master's or, or equivalent, um, I think it's really important to keep coming back to get refreshed, to you know add some new tools to the toolkit, um, make new friends, make new network connections. All of those things are really important. And so in the book, um, I think it's the last chapter in End of Advantage. I really spend a lot of time on that. So there's a there's a one page quiz you can take, which sort of says, how prepared are you? It's things like, you know, I've learned a new skill, even if it wasn't directly relative to my job, or I've, I, you know, if I lost my job suddenly, I know 10 people I could call that would help yeah. me find the next one. It's those kinds of things I think we need to be thinking about. What about, you know, putting ourselves in uncomfortable situations and, you know, forcing ourselves to learn new things, you know, by, by, or forcing ourselves to, to, to hang out with people who aren't like us? Oh, I think it's crucial. I think it's crucial. Yeah. You know, if you think about it, if everybody you interact with is just like you, there's a lot of overlap. Uh, so they're, they're, they may be very comfortable, it may be very fun, but you're not going to learn a whole lot that's different than what you already knew. Do you, th do you think that most leaders have the necessary learnings to, to cope with the kind of crisis we're going through now? I mean, or do you think there's a sort of very different skill set for, for, you know, wartime CEO versus a peacetime CEO? You know, people talk about that. I mean, I do think that when times are good, and Tom Colditz says this very nicely, um, he says, you know, people will put up with awful, terrible, incompetent, stupid leadership when times are good. But when times are harder, they really look for competence. And so I think a lot of leaders in peacetime, in good times, who aren't actually great leaders, they get away with a lot, right? Yeah, okay. But, um, but Tom will also tell you that the the raw material, if you will, the trust, the, uh, the the courage that you need for wartime is actually built up during peacetime. And that's when people know that they can rely on you and trust you. So it's an interesting nuance there, I think. So, so in other words, peacetime, sorry, wartime just, you know, just, you know, highlights deficiencies in leaders and also potentially the lack of goodwill that they built up when times were good. One of the things that I find super frustrating as a, as a person who studies organizations is you can make stupid, 
ill-informed, poorly advised, really dumb decisions and have a great outcome because you happen to be in the right place yep. at the right time. You got lucky, you know, whatever. And you can make well-considered, very smart, strategically substantive decisions and end up with a bad outcome. So, you know, take take a company like Disney, right? Here they are, um, you know, launching their streaming service and hitting success on every possible dimension, you know, and COVID-19 comes along and now nobody's going to theme parks. Well, that wasn't their fault. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And so I think one of the things I really encourage people really to, to, to differentiate is don't judge the quality of a strategy only by whether it delivered the results that you were looking for, because they're not always, that's not always a predictable metric. Do you think the qualities of what made a good CEO sort of 30 or 40 years ago are different from the qualities you'd need now to be a successful CEO? You know, I don't think they're different. I think, I think you could in the Jack Welch you know, Lee Iacocca era, um, you sort of had the the hero CEO who strode boldly upon the planes and cast commands and all that stuff. I think even then, uh, and certainly today, we're really looking for CEOs to be much more connectors, collaborators, yeah. bringing out the best in their organizations, much less of the command and control kind of CEO. And at the same time, we have this cultural myth almost of the hero CEO who's going to come down and tell you what to do and everything's going to be fine rather than the organization having to figure it out you know and I think we're, we're slowly realizing that the organization figuring it out is actually um, more of the norm. What is creative leadership and, and do you think it's now the time to have more women in leadership roles is, is, that, is that what the new sort of post competitive advantage era calls for? I think so. Um, so the word crescive leadership was actually coined in the 1980s. My friend, um, uh, Jay Bourgeois and a co-author of his, and they were cataloging le leadership styles. And they they had four that they felt pretty comfortable with. So there was the, you know, the command and control leader, and then there was the coalition builder and the, you know, a, 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 a forest of archetypal leadership. And then they ran across this fifth style. They could not figure out uh, what, what to do with it. And uh, finally they said, all right, we'll make it its own category. And they didn't spend much time on it, but they called it crescive for, uh, which I think is Latin for growth leader. Okay. And, you know, aggressive leaders are much more about discovering the organization's capabilities, shaping decision-making, shaping decision premises, da, 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 da. and a lot of those practices are actually um, much more closely associated with, with women's styles of leading for whatever reason than they have typically been with men's. And so I think it's very interesting now as we look across the world, you know, at which countries have done well in the midst of this pandemic. Yeah. And overwhelmingly, there have been countries that have had female leaders. Mm. <laughs> you know, calm, right? I mean, if you look at Angela Merkel or, or the Prime Minister of New Zealand, and you know, calm, factual, right? Not fear-mongering, but just like matter of fact. And, you know, here's what we need to do. Let's take it step by step. And here's why. And, um, and this is what I know. And this is what I don't know. And I'm going to be very transparent about those things. And, you know, it engenders trust. It engenders... Um, a willingness to cooperate. It engenders a feeling that, you know, someone capable is sort of manning the helm, uh, unlike the rather chaotic response of a lot of other countries. Mark Zuckerberg once had designs on, on top office on running for, running for president. How do you think Mark Zuckerberg would have fared in the pandemic? Well, there's sort of a angel and a devil quality about Zuckerberg. So on the angel side, I think he's brilliant at... Um, seeing systems, you know, thinking systemically, seeing how parts interconnect. I mean, you couldn't run a thing like Facebook without having that skill. So I think in terms of fitting together how the whole system would need to respond to something that, and, you know, the thing about the COVID-19 is it's a, it's a systemic threat. It's not a isolated, you know, one yeah. part of the economy falters while others are fine. It's everybody's affected. So I think he would have been really good at figuring that out and seeing down into the details of that. Um, what I don't think he's very good at is, um, you know, he's not relatable. He's not an empathic sort of person. He is kind of cold. Um, so I'm not sure he would have been great at bringing people along with that vision. And don't forget, you know, since the age of, what, 21, he's used to calling all the shots in yeah. every way. I mean, he doesn't get challenge. And uh, in a political environment, you're constantly dealing with people challenging your judgment. You don't have all the authority. You can't just make a decision and have, every, you know, 2,000 people, you say, turn right, they all do it. So I think he would have gotten himself into a lot of trouble um, with the politics. And, you know, a lot of brilliant business people go into politics and, and have that you know, they're, they're used to being able to say, well, this is what we're going to do. And everybody says, okay, you know, yeah. and in politics, it isn't like that. Yeah. The electorate can be a bit 
more quickly, right? Well, you know, by definition, most of Western democracies anyway are designed with a balance of powers. And that means there's a balance of powers. The, the reason I asked the Mark Zuckerberg question was, that, you know, it might seem a bit random. It's just that you, you sort of take aim at Facebook, right, in the book, mm-hmm. and you suggest that they may be on the cusp of, you know, of, of an inflection point. And I just, you know, just it's not something we've discussed so far. So I just wanted to, to introduce that, that idea and, and why you think that might be the case. Well, my issues with Facebook are... When you are engaging, when your fundamental business model relies on your customers being ignorant of what you're doing, I just think that's a fundamental weakness. And until very recently, even today, I don't think customers understand. You know, when you post that baby picture to Facebook, it is no longer yours, it's theirs. When you tell Facebook, you know, or Google or any of the other big ones, I happen to pick on Facebook, but, you know, if you tell them I'm going to buy gas at the post office, you know, and visit the post office and whatever, um, they own that data. And there is, you know, super scary tracking information. And and the reason I, I get kind of up in my extras about this a little bit is that uh, there was at one point the... Um, the Library Act that, that that authorized libraries, at least in the United States, basically said it was the solemn duty of a librarian to keep private what people were looking up in the library. Because if you were to reveal that, it would be such a breach of privacy. Oh, my God. The fact that I was looking up, you know, baby care books meant maybe I was pregnant. You know, oh, my God. And, and yet here we are gaily handing over the most intimate details of every moment of our waking lives to these companies that are not accountable to anyone. Zuckerberg has almost complete power over that company due to the way its stock structure is designed. And, you know, it's another case of uh, of business practice getting ahead of institutional ability to regulate it. So, you know, I have no like personal vendetta against Facebook. I just think when your business model requires that your customers are basically ignorant and you, you know, contribute to that, you're, you're not transparent, you're not honest about what you're doing with the data. And then Cambridge Analytica was just this, this bit of the surface. And if you look at the uh, you know, the way bad actors are using the platform, if you look at their sort of washing their hands of, oh, no, we're not publishers, but yet we derive a huge percentage of our revenue from the ability to, you know, reproduce news that's created by other organizations that have to get paid for it somehow. First of all, I don't think their their outcome in a, in a political, social sense is very positive. And I think we haven't yet quite accounted for the, um, the imbalances they've uh, created in our system of kind of interacting with each other, getting news, advertising, getting paid, you know, that's all kind of not come together yet. So the reason I think they may be up for an inflection point now, it could be five years from now, it could be 10 years from now, but at some point um, people are going to say this is not legitimate, you know, and businesses in the long run that are regarded as not legitimate, you know, fate has not been kind to them. So take tobacco companies as a case in point. You know, once you begin to be seen as a provider of something dangerous, and in the case of Facebook, I think a lot of what Facebook is creating is social pollution. You know, it's just a you know, it's disinformation. There's and it's sucked all the revenue, you know, out of legitimate news organizations and 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 and. So I think at some point there's going to be a rebalancing. You ident or you or you highlight in the in the book is I think you call it type one and type two decisions, right? And and how the fact they haven't really adequately distinguished between the two. So, you know, if if I attempt to sort of describe that that concept, it's, it's this idea that when you're innovating, you can sort of, you know, you can move fast and break things. Um, much more comfortably if you know they're not going to have a big impact on society or the economy or whatever, mm-hmm. versus the ones where you need to be much, much more careful because of the ramifications of those decisions. And, you know, one of the arguments you make is that there hasn't been an adequate sort of differentiation between type one and type decision, type two decisions at, at Facebook. Well, Facebook is all about, you know, move fast and break things, right? And and to me, that's fine when you're, you know, you're experimenting with an app and you want to see if people like people talking in suits or talking in hoodies better. But, you know, fine. No, move fast. Go ahead. Do it. Um, when you're experimenting with democratic institutions that, uh, you know, are ill prepared to defend themselves against the actions of bad actors, that's, that's not, you know, that's not so risk free. Just to talk on a more positive note. So, you, you think about Satya Landella very differently, right? As somebody who took over from from um, Steve Ballmer, who was maybe a bit more of the sort of command control type CEO, uh, and and you know it, it wasn't. I suppose it was a good time for shareholders to you know uh, for, uh, Microsoft, but not such a good time uh, in terms of innovation, for example. And you think that Satya Nadella's leadership style is much much more akin to this digital age, this age of transient competitive advantage. Why, why, why do you think that? For a whole number of reasons, but one of the most, I think, important is he's got the whole company focused on what I call leading indicators rather than lagging indicators. So Balmer was all about profits, 
margins, you know, revenues. Uh, and Nadella, it's not that he doesn't care about those things, but what he's after is let's look at what drives profits, margins, revenues. Let's look at the behaviors that precede our acquisition of those wonderful things. And those behaviors are things like usage. Uh, and what drives usage? Well, customer love. What drives customer love? Empathy. <laughs> you know. So he took a Microsoft that was really like the velociraptor of the tech world, um, and really did a cultural transformation, looking at, at, you know, let's stop just talking smart. Let's start trying to be the smartest people in the room. Let's really focus on what the customer wants. And they talk a lot, a lot about a growth mindset. Let's talk about how do we really learn what the customer needs and what's going to drive their behavior. Well, I suppose two questions, right? How, how does a CEO like like Satya Nadella continue to grow and acquire new skills and new leadership qualities himself? And then secondly, do you, do you think that's the sort of single most important difference or the single most important catalyst for change in an organization to, to have the right leader in charge? Well, I think leadership is, is you know, it's, it's very difficult if your leader's um, not forward looking or, you know, if your leader has different priorities, it's, it's like super difficult to uh, work around that. You know, um, I mean, I've seen it happen where you'll have sort of a stealth move by people in the middle of the organization sort of working around the senior team, but it just, it's very effortful and it's not, it's not easy. With Nadella, I think, you know, his whole stance towards leadership. And I mean, you have to remember, he's a Microsoft lifer. So this is not a guy who came in from yeah. some cuddly, kind organization and decided to turn Microsoft around. You know, he's been there his whole life. So the advantage of that, going back to what I said earlier, the sort of secret sauce stuff is, you know, he really knows the organization. He's trusted. He's he's been seen as an effective leader there for years. And I think he's just made it a personal um, commitment of his own to keep to keep learning and to keep his people learning. And to make sure that they felt um, supported. And I mean, you know, it's it, it's it sounds very grandiose, but it comes down to a lot of relatively simple actions. So, for example, every week, you know, they have a senior leadership t- team meeting and they devote a chunk of time at that meeting to, um, I'm forgetting what they call it, but let's call it like creative imagination stories from around the world. And what they'll do is they'll beam, they'll virtually beam a small team that's working on something, you know, way far away from headquarters, something new, something interesting. And they get, you know, 20, 25 minutes of the senior team's time to talk about something cool they're working on. Well, that would never have happened under Bomber, I suspect. Things like that keep people's minds on the idea that it's all about the new, it's all about the next. We want to be open to hearing from people who are maybe not at our hierarchical level, but might maybe have great ideas. And if you watch video of Nadella uh, when he goes on business trips, when he travels, um, he always makes time to meet with children, always makes time to meet with younger people. He's got a huge emphasis on people who are differently abled, you know, so people with phys- physical uh, impairments of some kind, a huge effort on, on that to make sure that, that the products are inclusive, that those people's ideas can be included. And I think it comes from, you know, in many cases, having a son who is quite severely disabled and uh, the realization that, you know, these are still human beings with with innate value. They just happen to have different capabilities. A fascinating company because, it, you know, it's one that a lot of people were sort of starting to write off and then, you know, has made not just a shift, but a, a massively successful shift. And it's now, you know, leader in cloud computing. And and it's a question about succession planning, right? Because, you know, um, uh, your, your, your colleague, Steve Blank, um, wrote an ex- a really wonderful article um, where he talked about succession planning in tech companies. And his, his, his thesis was basically, you know, where you have a leader that's, you know, very visionary, he, tends, he or she tends to ra- surround themselves with people who just execute on the vision. And therefore, when the succession comes, you then have, you tend to have to be succeeded by somebody who's good at executing and doesn't have the vision. And then it takes the next generation to then have somebody who's, who's uh, you know, once again, a visionary. And you could, you could, you know, you could sort of superimpose that narrative on Microsoft. You could do the same thing on on Apple. Do you, do you buy into that or do you think it's not, you know, as... Oh, I think it makes a lot of sense. I mean, it's very hard to have multiple visionaries in one company. I mean, the only way I've ever seen that work is if you've got a strong divisional structure, you know, so you've got each visionary has their own swim lane, as it were. But at the top of the company, I mean, it's really hard because by definition, you know, if you talk about culture, visionaries are people who believe in let's create the future. And if I've got two visionaries with two different dreams of what the future could be, it's going to be really, really hard. Last question. So on, on the subject of, of visionary, so Clayton Christensen, so he, he wrote the foreword to your book, Seeing Around Corners. Uh, he was a contemporary of yours, a friend, a colleague. How big a legacy do you think Clayton Christensen will leave on the 
strategy and, and management profession? Oh, huge. Absolutely huge. I mean, Clay introduced the whole notion of disruptive, disruptive technologies, which challenged a lot of the prevailing assumptions at the time, you know, uh, the sort of David versus Goliath narrative and how did that work and the whole mechanic of disruption. And he was very... Um, Unfortunately, you know, the word has gotten quite abused because now disruption means anything that's a big change. Yeah. But he was very specific about what disruption was. And he was very specific about a lot of things. The whole jobs to be done idea uh, came from him. So I think he's had a, a huge influence on the way business leaders think. So, you know, absolutely ma major. Ritas, thank you so much for taking part in this podcast. It's been a great conversation. And I very much appreciate you taking the time and dialing in from your from your home. Thank you very much indeed. It's a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to Structural Shifts by Aperture. To learn more about our Aperture community, visit aperturehub.co. We are strategy for the networked age. Until next time.